Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel in this week's retro breakdown video where we're going to break down the GPU as well as some of the other specs inside the Nintendo Game Boy Advance. I'm trying to get through all of my highly requested videos as much as possible. I do have a very extensive list from all of you and I do plan on getting through it so please be patient if this isn't the video that you were looking forward to this week. But that being said if you are new here and you enjoy tech breakdown videos or tech in general then consider subscribing to catch my weekly uploads where I break down different computer and game console hardware. And if you enjoyed this video at all, make sure to hit the like button, that way YouTube will actually share it to others who may enjoy it as well. Now enough of all that, let's just dive right into the Game Boy Advance and the hardware technology that powered the device. Now the Game Boy Advance was a very powerful upgrade over the Game Boy and Game Boy Color that came before it, but to understand all that power, we should touch up on the CPU and the RAM as that paints the complete picture prior to breaking down the GPU of what the system was capable of and how it worked. Starting with the Game Boy Advance CPU, which was an ARM7 TDMI RISC or Reduced Instruction Set Computing Processor that ran at 16.78 MHz clock speed and supported both 32-bit as well as 16-bit thumb instructions. The thumb instruction set helps optimize performance when working across 16-bit allocations of memory that I will break down in a moment. This ARM CPU marked the first time ever for an ARM CPU being in a handheld gaming console and was also the first ARM processor that supported three-stage pipelines, fetching decoding and executing all simultaneously. The SOC of the GBA also had a coprocessor, an 8-bit sharp SM83 CPU that would not operate at the same time as the primary ARM CPU and didn't help at all in any way running Game Boy Advance games, but it was used for backwards compatibility with the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. This coprocessor ran at 4.19 MHz when running the former and 8.39 MHz when running the latter. Now for the RAM configuration of the Game Boy Advance is where we get a little bit detailed. In good old Nintendo fashion, we have multiple allocations of memory for different things. Starting with the memory built on the SOC itself, which contains two allocations of RAM, one of which is 32 kilobytes of IW RAM, or internal work RAM. It was wider 32-bit memory used by the CPU to store ARM instructions and other critical code. The SOC also stored the dedicated video memory used by the GPU, which was 96 kilobytes of VRAM running on a 16-bit bus and holds the actual data that is displayed on the screen. Outside the SOC, the motherboard has a larger but more narrow 16-bit 256 kilobyte allocation called EWRAM, or external work RAM. It was slower and was able to store anything that couldn't be stored in the internal work RAM, but it had to be ARM thumb code due to it being 16-bit, and thus developers had to work and get creative using 32-bit and 16-bit interfaces to create the awesome 2D graphics for the time on the system while also maximizing performance. Now with that found foundation laid down there, we can jump into the star of the show, the GPU. The graphics rendering on the GBA is handled by an advanced picture processing unit or PPU, an evolution of the GPU used in previous Nintendo handhelds and even the Super Nintendo. This GPU was powerful enough to support the 240 by 160 resolution that the Game Boy Advance had, while also sporting some of the best 2D graphics at the time, and even had the ability for 3D graphics elements as well, although primitive, of course, compared to today. Like I mentioned, it had 96 kilobytes of VRAM, with one kilobyte being OAM, or Object Attribute Memory, that holds the data for sprite attributes such as position and size, as as well as another kilobyte of palette RAM, which stored color data for backgrounds and sprites. The PPU was able to push up to 128 sprites per frame, with each sprite size ranging from 8x8 8 8 to 64x64 64 64 pixels, depending on demand, and each sprite could also use 16 to 256 colors. To render its graphics, the PPU supports a total of six rendering modes that ended up being divided into two primary types. The first main type was character mode, which was tile-based and contained the first three minor modes. Mode 0 had four background layers with no affine transformations, which is a geometric transformation that preserves lines and parallelism, but not necessarily distance or angles. Mode 1 had three background layers with one that is capable of rotation and scaling, and Mode 2, which has two background layers with affine transformations. So basically one mode with no spinning or zooming of any kind, one mode to meet in the middle, and another mode to allow full zooming and spinning capabilities. These modes are all based on traditional 2D tile mapping and are 
use for most GBA games due to how efficient they are. The second major mode category contains the three final modes and are the bitmap modes for full frame rendering. Mode 3 is one full screen high color frame such as 15 bit color with over 32,000 colors total. Mode 4 has two full screen frames with each using 256 color palette. And the final mode, mode 5, is two half size frames at 160 by 128 using full 15 bit color. These modes allow for more advanced non tiled visuals like when using any kind of 3D rendering or full screen artwork, but they obviously demand more processing power and more work from the developers, so was often avoided to preserve performance and time. One reason for this and one major thing to mention is that the GPA had no 3D hardware acceleration at all, so everything had to be done at a software level, adding to the performance hit and complexity of adding such graphics to a game running on the system. And for fun and usual tradition with my videos, I like to compare the predecessor of whatever console I'm covering with said console. And to get an idea of just how big of a jump we are going from the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Color had only an 8-bit CPU that ran at 8 megahertz. It also had 32 kilobytes of RAM and 16 kilobytes of VRAM. Much less VRAM overall, as well as no external RAM to be used as well either. The resolution was at 160 by 144, and even though the resolution was much higher, with its 32-bit and double the clock speed CPU, as well as a lot more memory across the board to use, the Game Boy Advance was still able to push out more advanced and complex graphics than the Game Boy Color and could even have those 3D graphics that we talked about not capable in the prior Game Boy Color. But overall, the Game Boy Advance was about as powerful as the Super Nintendo in handheld form for the time. It was a great console with the primary complaint being the fact that the screen had no backlight of any kind and only showed the beautiful graphics in more direct light. Something modern day gamers couldn't fathom how to do today, but just another indicator at how far we have come with mobile handheld gaming. But fam, that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this little quick breakdown of this classic console. I enjoyed walking down memory lane making this video, and I hope it provided at least a little bit of nostalgia as well as understanding of how the system worked for you. I apologize this video is kind of quick here in terms of a breakdown, just touching up on the basic points of what the console had in terms of hardware and what it was capable of. And this is where I'm going to throw in my disclaimer going forward with my future videos for the rest of June and the early parts of July. I am going on vacation later in July and I will be gone for two weeks and I have a lot of work to do before I leave both in my professional and my personal life so making these videos 12 plus minutes long is going to be very difficult at this time so my videos are going to be more succinct and I do apologize for that for people who do like to listen to as much depth as possible but it was either upload a lot less videos or no videos at all until I leave where I would like to keep my one video a week going up to and even during my vacation and having videos loaded and ready while I'm gone. I do apologize for anybody who's disappointed by that, but I only have so much time to make these, and things will definitely go back to the way they were at the end of July. But anyway, if you've stuck around this long and listened to me ramble, please shout out down below that you are a part of my ramble squad and watch the whole video so I can reach out and personally thank you for being what I consider a top supporter. I really appreciate you all so much, and I hope you do have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever time you're watching this, and I will catch you all in next week's video. Until then, peace.